What's up YouTube, it's Jacob from International Precision Engineering and today I want to talk about how I put an extra column on the little machine shop high torque mill to stiffen it up. So first I'll give you a preview of the setup as I had it before and sort of what motivated me to make this thing and then two, we'll do some cutting on the old setup and then I'll put it together and do some sort of before and after comparisons. I'm gonna try to take that footage, use the sound off the camera to run some diagnostics on the signal analyzer, and then after I'll show some quick clips on us actually making the base. Here's the old setup I was running. Basically just the mill in its free state, just sitting on the table and sitting on these rubber, they're just little rubber pads basically to keep it from sliding and adds just a tiny bit of damping between the table and the mill. Big thanks to my neighbor, the welder. What we, the proposed solution is to bolt this mill right into this frame here. And taking a closer look at this, quarter inch wall, three inch wide by four inches deep, and then that's welded right to the base here, which is a five inch solid steel plate. So to attach it, I have, <clears throat> I've tapped it for 3 8 16 and up here I have six holes both front and back that I can get mounting hardware to mount a spacer between here and the column and then an insert that goes into the column and the bolts will come out of here and bite the top of the column. I'll bring you in here on the setup, but basically what we were doing was what we had a half inch end mill in the spindle and we were doing side cutting on the corner of these square blanks and basically to make a chamfer. So the problem that we ran into was this mill is not really stout enough to swing a half inch end mill when you're side cutting. I've got the mill turned to the side here so that you could see what was going on. The side load was kind of out, away from the part, and sort of as the bit comes around, it's going to want to torque the spindle. So the dynamic modes are that this whole C shape is going to kind of open up, right, and resonate this way, but also the whole head is going to twist relative to the table in and out of the part as you're cutting on a side. So you could see these lines here, or these bite marks. So not only is it twisted this way, which means the, the C is opening and closing as the, with the, around the spindle, but it's also coming in and out of the part like this. From this view, I think you probably, hopefully you'll be able to see, actually visibly see this machine moving. So a couple things to point out. One, the control box I have off and I just have it clamped for right now. And everything else is the same. I'm going to adjust the Y-axis, lock it out with the, the screw or the, the jibs adjustment here. The Z is locked out. The cutting axis is tight enough for it to be kind of hard to turn, but not obviously locked so that I can't turn it. So with that cut, you can see the, sti the chips are still pretty good, but if you look at the surface finish, it's starting to get terrible.
All right, so I can definitely tell there's a big difference in stiffness. The really high pitch noise that you hear is actually the tool, or I think the tool unscrewing as it's as it's cutting. So the as it grabs and pulls kind of like in the perpendicular direction of the cutting flute, it's actually unwinding the tool down. So I tried to have a decibel meter to be able to tell before and after, but that high pitch frequency just that's what the decibel meter was measuring, and there's no way for me in the near future to be able to filter out that high pitch noise with that instrument. So I'll take the footage from the camera that was right next to the machine, and I'll try and do some um, instrumentation on it to see what we can find. I'm hoping that the resonant frequency went up a little bit. That's an obvious sign that it's getting stiffer for the same amount of mass. But like I said, I think it's a big deal. You can definitely tell in, in the, the, that frequency, um, it, that exciting that frequency is a lot less sensitive to speed. So before it was like no matter what you did with the speed and sort of plowing into it, it would kind of always fall into that resonance and just start going crazy. But with this setup, like I said, it's, and as you can see from the three different speeds that I did, only one of them hit that resonance and the other two didn't. And they were the same speeds, the same feeds. And I think that anywhere I put the knob, it's with the exception of that, like right at that frequency of the flutes and of that resonant frequency, I think that it did great. So let's hit the lab and see what we can see. We're in the lab here and we have a 1990s era signal analyzer that we're basically just looking at the footage from the camera through the headphone jack and then plugging that right into the input of the signal analyzer. Basically what this instrument does is it takes the input from a signal, in this case an audio signal, runs Fourier analysis on it and it charts the waveform on the bottom and then essentially the Fourier analysis up top. All this is is a graph of frequency on the bottom and then how what the amplitude at that frequency is. So it's kind of like a reverse equalizer in your home stereo system. So you can see a couple things right off the bat. First, that the resonant frequency clearly went up, right? So mission accomplished. But the other thing that's interesting is when I was talking about the knob wasn't as sensitive to resonance as after compared to before, what I meant was this. So on the screen we have just a screenshot of the before and you can see if we take what is called modal analysis, where we're looking for peaks along the spectrum, there's a ton of them and they're kind of all at the same amplitude. If we look at the after resonance picture, you can see that there's clearly defined peaks and clearly defined troughs, okay? So what that means is that if we keep the excitation frequencies in the troughs, we're less prone to fall into one of those resonances, or we're less prone to excite one of the major resonances. So if you think about this as like a marble in a bowl, okay, you put a, a marble anywhere on the surface of the bowl and it's gonna wanna tend to the bottom, okay? That's like nature finding its way of a uh, least energy system. Okay, so, on the Fourier chart, you can think of it as if we flip the Fourier chart upside down and stick a marble where we're going to put an excitation frequency, it's going to want to roll into, a, into one of those resonant peaks, okay? So the goal would be to put the marble as far away from one of those as possible or keep it within reason to one of those nodes, okay? So the nodes are the best probability that you're not going to excite a resonance and that's probably where you want to run the main frequency. So that's a combination of spindle, 
and your number of flutes, okay, and all, all that stuff. The other kind of thing adding to that is you're never really just putting one frequency into the machine, okay? So like as the bit comes around, it, it curls that flute all along it. So it might be sort of chopping very quickly like a little axe or it could just be slicing through like a knife through butter. So all of this stuff comes into play. And on top of that, there's so many different resonant modes of the machine that they reflect differently and, and maybe the movement of the head sort of excites a different frequency somewhere else in the machine. So it's really, really complicated, but at the end of the day, sort of just looking at simple pictures and really sort of what can I do with my simple options here to optimize this process. And then lastly, the, the sort of the problem with this setup as we did it was one, that two kilohertz squeal just basically turned the audio, audio signal into a two kilohertz square wave. So it filtered out a lot of the information that we were trying to get. And then two, the auto gain and frequency filtering in the camera microphones didn't do us any favors either. So we're using this tiny little sliver of information in this crazy big signal. So the signal to noise ratio on these was very, very low and it made the analysis very tough. What, what we would probably want to do, because this is a really cool instrument to play around with in the shop, what I probably am going to do is get a microphone and get it directly into here. The problem is this thing is so old, I mean it has like a GPIB card and stuff which we could probably work with, but saving the information in sync to the camera is really, really tough. So maybe I might just stick a camera on this while we're doing the machining. I don't know, but two things. Getting the auto gain off, completely off. I don't want any filtering from my camera or data recording device. And then you want to optimize the microphone to the frequencies that you're looking for. So an audio microphone is something like two, maybe, I don't know, 500 hertz to 20 kilohertz or something like that. Well, we want to optimize way at the low end of that spectrum where the machine noise is going to be. So like zero to 500 hertz probably is our target window. So maybe an even an accelerometer might be the best. So. so I had a lot of fun making this video. I think that even with sort of a 50% effort on production, I, I, I think we got the gist of it. So. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. In the meantime, here's probably some really terrible videos and pictures of us making the mill base. The mill is bolted to the base, and then up top we have this gap. So you just take a snap gauge, and measure really at the top hole and then at the bottom hole to get your gap and taper. And, and then we'll machine the spacer to those dimensions. And then as I was talking about before, this threaded, this threaded aluminum plate will go down into the column to catch the bolts from the back. We chose aluminum because this will actually crush a little bit to the casting surface so you can see these marks on there. And those are from the irregularities in the casting. And I was able to touch off here, bring it down 20 thousandths, which is our taper over the distance between these two holes. So touch off here, bring it down 20 thousandths, and then mill machine, and you can see, see it stopped cutting here. So my taper is not exact, but it's pretty good. So now that we know our taper is correct, so we'll, we, have, we can measure on this area here, and we'll just bring it down till our spacing is correct, and then put it in.